with you this evening to tell you about our new book. I'm Kurt House. And I'm Roy Young. And the book's title is Chasing Billy the Kid, Frank Stewart and the Capture of William H. Bonney. Now let us tell you about how we got started on this, this here book. Uh, well, it all started when uh, I bought a gun, an antique pistol, and it had the mysterious monogram on the pearl grips, FS. And the story that came with the gun, and it was well documented, excellent provenance, I'm only the sixth owner since the original owner, is a fascinating one. And at the time, neither Roy nor I knew much about Frank Stewart. The provenance that came with the gun said it belonged to this guy named Frank Stewart, who was a New Mexico lawman, and that it was one of a, quote, brace of pistols, which means a pair in the old terminology, uh, given to a guy named Frank Stewart uh, in gratitude by the citizens of Las Vegas, we'll tell you exactly who in a minute, uh, in, in gratitude for capturing Billy the Kid. So Roy and I set out on a quest to find out more about this mysterious Frank Stewart. And so, Roy, you want to tell them a little bit about what we found? Yes. Uh, this was in the uh, fall of 2017. I had just retired from a 50-year ministry, and I was kind of at loose ends. And Kurt said, why don't you come down and do some work for me on my library and a little bit of research? Well, about halfway through my time here, it was time to figure out who Frank Stewart was. And I thought I was gonna do a five or six page report and move on to a, another character. Well, as I got deeply into uh, the story of Frank Stewart, I went to Kurt and I said, this is a book. Yeah. This is a book. It's more than an article. We thought it might just turn out to be an article or something. And as we began to investigate original documents and contemporary 1880 newspapers, we saw that Frank Stewart had quite a role in the chase and capture of Billy the Kid. And as we reviewed the literature, we found that Frank Stewart was virtually unrecognized, didn't get any credit at all, and all the credit went to Pat Garrett. And why was that, Roy? Well, after Pat Garrett had killed Billy the Kid in 1881 uh, there at Fort Sumner, New Mexico, uh, he very soon started a book uh, basically entitled, I won't give all the words because there's about 30 words in the title, An Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. And uh, he had a ghost writer uh, by the name of Ash Upson. But as the story unfolded and uh, Pat dictated to Ash and Ash asked questions, Pat made himself the hero of the entire story uh, of the life of Billy the Kid, especially uh, his life in uh, New Mexico. And we found that Frank Stewart had barely a mention and certainly very little credit for what turned out to be the fantastic chase and capture of Billy the Kid. And as we did our research, we just uncovered another fascinating story after another fascinating aspect of all of these characters. And the irony of this whole book was that neither Roy nor I were very much interested in Billy the Kid. That's right. And uh, actually, I remember telling you, uh, I didn't think there was anything else to be discovered about Billy the Kid, did you? No, and well, actually, I think I told you, I, I've never had any interest in that juvenile delinquent. Uh, my forte has been uh, the Earps and Doc Holliday and Tombstone and some of the Texas Rangers, and your forte was? John Wesley Harden, the Texas Rangers, and mainly Texas outlaws. But Roy came from a good background. He had already done a, a book on the Lavo County Outlaw, where we are here today at Mission Sincaja. And nevertheless, we got 
very interested in this untold story of a man named Frank Stewart. So the provenance of the gun was impeccable. Sometimes guns don't have that good a provenance. But remember this was just class A provenance. I had a 1930 affidavit from uh, Frank Talley, uh, going back to Nick Chafin, and on back Frank Stewart, Frank Stewart to Nick Chafin. And so Roy got on to Nick Chafin, we never heard of Nick Chafin before, no. and Roy was able to dig up some stuff showing who Nick Chafin was. Turns out he was a blacksmith in Las Vegas, New Mexico. So that's obviously how he knew Frank Stewart. Now let's tell him a little bit about who Frank Stewart was. Yes, uh, we wanted the book to not just focus totally on Billy the Kid because we're trying to bring Frank Stewart a little more prominence and recognition. So we began to investigate who the man was and we learned very quickly that Frank Stewart was an alias for a, a, a fellow named Johan Green or John Green as he came to be called in uh, America. And uh, when he was a boy, his mother died. Uh, Frank was, oh, maybe 12, 14 years old. And his father developed tuberculosis. So they decided to move to Kansas where they both uh, took work uh, on a ranch. Soon, Frank's father died. I'm calling him Frank because that's uh, what people today will know about, uh, will know his name as uh, on the Billy the Kid story. And uh, he eventually teamed up with a fellow named Charlie Seringo. And uh, they came to the Panhandle of Texas on a cattle buying trip and were involved for some time with one another. Uh, and I won't go very much into Charlie Seringo's story, but he was a self-aggrandizing uh, fella who wrote five or six books, all telling the same story in a little different perspective. And he never once mentions Frank Stewart with any credibility whatsoever. When he does mention Frank, he makes him out to be a, a crank or a crook, and in fact, even once accuses him of stealing uh, uh, the reward money for the capture of Billy the Kid. But I digress. Um, Frank led a somewhat nefarious life. Uh, he got mixed up in uh, uh, several affairs in which uh, some men ended up being killed. And um, where should we go from there, Ted? Well, we don't want to spoil the book, you know, Roy. Well, that's true, that's true. We think people ought to buy the book because we were the most surprised of anybody about this new information that we made. We, we found a lot of new discoveries, uh, photos that never before had been seen, uh, early Las Vegas, New Mexico history, the relationship of all these previous owners, and uh, well, then, Frank, Frank actually uh, becomes a, a, de a cattle detective um, after he and Seringo go their separate ways. Frank is hired as a cattle detective for what was then called the Canadian River Cattlemen's Association, and later morphed into the Panhandle Plains Cattlemen's Association. Well, Frank was hired specifically to go into New Mexico and. Uh, uh, track down the wrestled cattle. He was to look for cattle browns in the various herds of cattle. And at that time, in the 1880s, uh, cattle rustling was really booming in West Texas, especially, as Roy mentioned, along the Canadian River on into New Mexico. So the Canadian River Cattlemen's Association hired Frank Stewart to go straighten this out and find out who was stealing the cattle, right, John? Mainly uh, John Chisholm's cattle, who had one of the largest spreads of anybody at the time, thousands and thousands of head of cattle, and yet they were disappearing. So uh, back in the 1880s, the Canadian River Cattlemen Association banded together. The leader was Charles Goodnight, and so they took off to New Mexico, didn't they? Uh, after Frank did his first investigative tour, he came back and reported to uh, the officers and uh, members of the Cattlemen's Association uh, 
and uh, they determined that they needed to put together a posse. And uh, Frank then took a posse into uh, New Mexico to track down who's doing the wrestling. And later, Charlie Seringo has a posse and follows up so that there's two posses from the Texas Panhandle. And in New Mexico, Pat Garrett is putting together a posse. So it ends up there's three posses, which eventually uh, become one with a nucleus from the three posses. And uh, this book is going to be really enlightening for uh, people in the Panhandle or interested in Panhandle history because it turns out this posse was composed of cowboys from the LS, uh, the LIT, which is George Littlefield, and the LX yes. branch. The LX is still in existence, I think. So picture these cowboys off in New Mexico, near Las Vegas, Seven Rivers uh, area, and uh, Frank and uh, his posse and uh, Pat Garrett are both equally uh, leaders of this posse. Pat Garrett was not any above uh, Frank Stewart, in fact, don't you think, Roy? And this came about at a place called Llewellyn Springs. Um, Frank is there, Pat Garrett is there, um, and Charlie Seringo and some of his men are there. And uh, Pat asked Frank if he would take charge and tell what they were getting ready to do and why. And at the end, Charlie Seringo backs out and uh, most of his men uh, back out. But the nucleus of Frank Stewart's posse and Pat Garrett's posse form the one new posse. Uh, and of course, Pat has the better information on where Billy might be because Pat's living in New Mexico. And from there begins what we call the chase that leads to the capture of Billy the Kid. And the success of the posse is what led many people to claim to be a part of the posse who really weren't even there. And there's always been some mix up in the literature about who exactly was there and who wasn't. So one of the tasks of uh, Roy in my research was to determine just exactly who was really there. And you remember a couple of them claimed to be there and they weren't even there, we found out. Uh, exactly, because later on, the capture of Billy the Kid was a world famous event, uh, carried in the New York Times, and the Boston newspapers, Chicago, San Francisco. And so later cowboys wanted to claim that they were part of the posse. And the bulk of our book is on the chase that leads to the capture of Billy the Kid and his cohorts at uh, Stinking Spring, uh, where... Uh, and that's Singular Spring. <laughs> yes, uh, most, most people say Stinking Springs, but there's no S on the end of spring. We love detail and we're trying to correct everything that we can to make it as, uh, uh, as right as it possibly can be. Yeah, factual. Both Roy and I are sticklers for uh, facts, so we don't, you won't find any fiction in our book. Nothing about Brushy Bill Roberts or anything like that. This is the real stuff. So let's get back to the story without revealing all of our uh, discoveries. Yes, uh, and, and once the capture takes place at Stinking Spring, our book continues with how they managed to get uh, Billy and the boys to Las Vegas and on to uh, uh, Santa Fe where they were uh, jailed. And that's a most interesting story about how that all took place and the trouble that they had in getting the reward money because Governor Lou Wallace was off on a book signing tour. Lou Wallace, you know, wrote uh, Ben-Hur. And uh, Pat and Frank uh, going around in Santa Fe, the, this saloon and that saloon. And there's some really interesting stories there that we've come to share. Um, and we won't go into all the detail on that because we want you to read our book. You know, Roy, one of my favorite things about the whole story was the situation where the posse, Stuart Garrett posse, finally trailed Billy and his friends, uh, Billy Pickett, uh, help me out here. Tom Pickett. 
Tom Pickett, Billy Wilson, Wilson, Dave Rudabaugh, Dave Rudabaugh, Dave Wilson, and Charlie Bowdry, Bowdry. Yeah, four <laughs> of them. And uh, it was a cold, cold December night, about December the 22nd, wouldn't it be, in New Mexico, and they had just killed, a, well, a Tom Follier in Fort Sumner. Yes. And so they, the gang, Billy's gang, that is, ran off, and uh, Pat Garrett and uh, Frank Stewart started trailing them. And it, their job was made easier because of the snow. So they trailed them towards uh, Brazil Wilcox ranches down there to Stinking Spring, and there was only one old rock house there. So they figured that that's where the gang would hold up. And it turns out that when they tracked them, indeed, they sneaked up there at dark of night, and they did see, uh, I think it was three horses outside, two horses had been taken inside this little bitty rock house, bitterly cold, picture this, uh, with uh, the five guys at that time, and uh, Pat Garrett wanted to rush them and just, uh, start the shooting, but Frank Stewart, cooler mind, prevailed. Tell them about that. Yes, of course, this is a, a pitch dark night uh, with uh, some light from the moon and the, and the snow. But uh, Pat's idea was, let's rush this rock house and just kill, the, kill these outlaws. And Frank said, uh, no, we're not gonna do that uh, because some of our men might end up being killed. So they waited till dawn the next morning uh, when Charlie Beaudry came out to uh, feed uh, the horses. They thought that was Billy the Kid because he was wearing Billy's sombrero. Can I, can I interject yeah. something here? But it was always very poignant to me to identify with these poor old posse members lying out there in the snow all night after Frank said, no, let's wait till morning. Now picture this, folks. You're lying in the snow all night long. The guys inside the rock house are every deplorable human condition you can think of. They are hungry, they are tired, they are cold, they are scared, and it was just horrible for those guys in that house. And yet here's the posse got the whole rock house surrounded. So guess what happens? This is when Charlie Beaudry comes out the next morning to uh, feed the horses and he's wearing Billy's sombrero. And uh, in the dusk, they thought that was Billy the Kid and uh, Pat Garrett and at least one or two of the others shot him thinking they were killing Billy when it was uh, Charlie. And this leads to uh, a discussion back and forth for the next several hours on uh, a surrender and Rudabaugh was ready to surrender, even waved a, a white flag to discuss it, but Billy was against it. One reason that it took so many hours for uh, the surrender to finally take place. And it's just very uh, spine tingling for me as a researcher to visualize those poor old posse members out there all night long, and then finally talk them into coming out and, and one very interesting thing I thought was what brought Billy's gang to surrender. And uh, there are various accounts of what happened, but uh, one of the most uh, colorful ones that I can think of was the account that after Beaudry had been killed, the posse was hungry outside too, and they built a fire and started cooking breakfast. And doggone man, they were cooking eggs and bacon and everything, and coffee, and you can imagine those poor outlaws in there started smelling that bacon, and that made it worse, and they were anxious to get out of there, weren't they, Roy? And, and finally did uh, surrender with a promise that they would be taken safely to Santa Fe. And of course, a number of things intervened between getting them to Santa Fe that take place along the road to Greg um, um on into Las Vegas where they spent one night. Uh, 
uh, trying to get the boys on the train uh, up to Glorieta Pass and on into Santa Fe with the uh, local Mexican people in uh, uh, Las Vegas trying to capture Charlie, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dave Rudabaugh, uh, who they thought had killed one of their uh, 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 jailers. Well, the story goes on and on, and what we want to point out to you is that Frank Stewart had an afterlife. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. He uh, becomes a deputy sheriff. He becomes a uh, railroad detect detective. And uh, so the story opens with Frank Stewart, closes with Frank Stewart, but in between, uh, it's his association with Pat Garrett in the capture of Billy the Kid. And one of the most interesting things about the whole project was how we discovered Frank Stewart's real name. You got to realize that as a detective, he didn't want to use his real name because he was undercover and he didn't want the gang or anybody else to know who he really was. So not until 1935, about mm -hmm. in the Amarillo newspaper, the old John Green gives an interview, grants an interview to the Amarillo paper and confesses that he was Frank Stewart. Yeah. And John Green was Frank Stewart. And it's just fascinating when we discovered this, uh, what happened in that account. Of course, that's Frank Stewart telling it many years later. But uh, Frank Stewart was an interesting guy. Let's tell him about the gun presentation. Yes, uh, when uh, the posse brought Billy the Kid and the boys into Las Vegas, uh, most of the town was excited and thrilled and wanted to see Billy the Kid and the, the uh, lawman who had uh, brought him in. And several uh, weeks later, they began to present gifts to Pat Garrett and Frank Stewart. And among those gifts was the brace of guns of which Kurt had bought one that started us on this whole journey. And uh, that was what was exciting to me because very rarely in Western history do you ever have the presentation of guns documented. And this is the best documentation with details of guns I've ever seen. It said in something like this in the Las Vegas paper. Uh, today, uh, W. Scott Moore presented Frank Stewart with a brace of fancy pistols in gratitude uh, for the capture of the kid's gang. So when we saw that, we realized there was actually another pistol. Yeah. And yet, uh, I had some provenance data that said, that described the other pistol, which appeared in 1996 when it sold at auction for a lot of money. And so Roy and I began a quest of finding the other pistol because the other pistol had inscribed on its handle not only the fancy Victorian FS monogram, but on the other side of the grip, it said presented by W. Scott Moore to Frank, Frank Stewart. Stewart. And so we thought, who is W. Scott Moore? And that was a big part of the story. And uh, the funny thing, Kurt and I and several of the Wild West History Association members were at a ranch in Colorado owned by one of our board members and we were looking at his gun collection. Now we'd already been looking for the gun for over a year. Right. And so we're in, uh, we're in this uh, replica marshal's office where a lot of the guns are in cases. And my wife, Charlotte, looked down and she saw that gun with the name Frank Stewart on it. She said, Kurt, aren't you and Roy working on Frank Stewart? Here's his gun. Yeah, she said, isn't this the guy y'all are working on? We go over there and look down in the case and there's the other gun, consecutive serial number. So was that serendipity or what? That was serendipity, and it turned out to mo motivate us along to where we are now. We have just finished the manuscript on uh, Chasing Billy the Kid. Uh, the book should be released uh, sometime in March or early April uh, of 2022. 
And we hope some of the things we've shared with you today will entice you because it's telling a new aspect of the whole Billy the Kid story that is factually documented. It's not myth, it's not legend, it's not I think so, or possibly or maybe. We document everything that we say and we want you to be looking forward to the release of Chasing Billy the Kid, Frank Stewart, and the capture of William H. Bonney. I want to point out, or I'm not sure it was clear to the listeners, that we were talking about Las Vegas, New Mexico, not so well known town. Uh, and that's where all this occurred. And the guns were consecutive, and for the first time in 140 years, we got them back together, photographed them two years ago. And how did we? meet and get on to this whole project. Let's tell them. How did we meet? Yeah, through this organization. That, that's a story that you and I love to tell because we met in 2009 in San Antonio, Texas, when we came here for the second annual Wild West History Association Roundup. I was aware of Kurt. I don't know if he was aware of me, well, but our good friend Bob McCubbin introduced us and uh, we, as board members of the Wild West History Association, want to thank WWHA for this opportunity to present the story of our new book uh, on Billy the Kid in this fireside story. The Wild West History Association means so much to me, and I know it does to Roy too, but it's just the most exciting uh, group I've ever been a part of, and I want to encourage anybody interested in Western history to look us up on the web and join our group. We mark graves of unknown outlaws and lawmen. We go around the country or we have an annual roundup, we call it, where we take field trips to various uh, interesting sites of outlaws, lawmen, Western events. And it's just, I can't say enough good about the Wild West History Association. Thank you, Kurt. And we do produce a quarterly journey, a, a journal of 90 to 100 pages, full of factually documented articles on the Wild West. Look us up on the, on the web, www.wildwesthistory.org. It's just been a pleasure. <laughs>